and it's a chapter that's often looked at at this time of year. It's uh, Luke 24, and it's the account of the resurrection, and it's the unique way in which Luke tells the resurrection story. So turn to chapter 24 of uh, Luke, and the first 12 verses have a standard resurrection account. Um, Luke focuses on the women, uh, the disciples who had been at the cross, and how they then go to the tomb very early in the morning, and they find the tomb empty, and uh, there was a uh, distress because they couldn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Verse 4 then says, they were greatly perplexed. Then behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, these two men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not you, but he is risen. And then you have uh, the names of the women and how they go back and tell the disciples and Peter, verse 12, Peter arose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Then you get this tremendous account of two journeying to the village of Emmaus. So from verse 13, we'll read down into verse 32. Now, we've looked at this passage many times. Let's do so again this morning. So Luke 24, verse 13. So behold, two of them were traveling on the, day, the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things that had happened that weekend. And so it was, while they were deep in conversation and they were reasoning together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what's this conversation that you're having and as you walk along the road and are looking so sad? Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, said, are you the only person in Jerusalem who have not known the things which have happened over these past days. Jesus said to them, what things? And they replied, well, the things about this Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. The things about how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be condemned to death, how he was crucified. Now we were hoping that this was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, apart from all of this, today is the third day since all of this has happened. And this morning, certain women of our company who had gone to the tomb early, they astonished us when they got there, they did not find his body. And they came to us saying that they had seen a vision of angels who told them that he was alive. Now, some of us then went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they didn't find. Then he said to them, oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, as they drew near to the village where they were going, he indicated to them that he was going to carry on walking. But they prevailed upon him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening and the day is gone. So he went in to stay with them. And it came to pass. As he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. 
And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they got up at that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 who were with and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. So I want to do two things. This, in a sense, is a passage about the scriptures. And I want to show you how Luke has put the passage together. And it's one of those occasions when I'm going to be pointing out to you the shape of this passage. And uh, it's always useful if you've got your Bible so that I can show you how verse so-and-so is linked to verse so-and-so. If you don't, that's not a problem. But it's always a challenge, I think, in a sermon to try and show you the shape of a passage. We'll do that in a second. And then after we've sang our next hymn, we'll look at the sermon together and we'll see what Luke is doing here. This is what's known as a journey narrative. And uh, Luke is very keen to tell stories about people on a journey. And uh, these two are on a journey to Emmaus from Jerusalem. And then they find something happens and they go back to Jerusalem. It's a journey story. So we we'll look at that together. So firstly, let me try and show you the shape of this passage. So if you start with verses 14 and 15 of Luke 24, you can see that they are going on a journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And uh, we are told that that's a seven mile journey and it's on the day of the resurrection. So it's the same day uh, of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, as you go back to the end of this account, verses 33 and 34, what do you find them doing? They're going back to Jerusalem. So do you see how this passage starts with the, the journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and then the passage ends with Emmaus to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is at the start and the end of this narrative. Second thing I want you to see is that Luke is emphasizing the eyes of these two disciples. So verse 16 says, their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. As you then go down to the end of the passage, verses 31 and 32, then their eyes were opened and they knew him. So look at how this passage is being put together. You've got Jerusalem and Jerusalem, and then you have this connection between eyes the eyes were closed at the start and the eyes were opened at the end. And then notice a phrase that keeps repeating itself. Verses 19 through to 21, you've got the term things. What things? The things that have happened in verse 18 over these past days, verse 19, Jesus says, what things? And so they say to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, things. Go down to verses 25 to 27. And he said to them, oh, foolish ones, and so on, you have a mention of things. Look at verse 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So can you get a sense of how Luke writes the story? Jerusalem, eyes, things. And uh, I guess what you also need to see is that there's an interaction between Jesus and these two. The first interaction is verses 17 to 18. The second, verses 28 to 30. Now, as you put this whole structure together, Luke is leading you to the very heart of the story. And the very heart of the story is in verse 23. So the two are recounting to Jesus the things that have happened. And in verse 23, they say, 
When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. So they is the center of this account. He is alive. So whether you are thinking of Jerusalem, eyes, things, the interaction between Jesus on the road initially, and then in the house of one of them, the, the whole thrust of this account is that he is alive. Well, we'll take up the journey motif then after we sing our next hymn, and it's in the green book this time. So turn to the green hymn books and, verse, and uh, hymn number 34. Let's sing hymn number 34. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day. Let's sing this. We'll remain in our seats as we sing, and then we'll turn again to this narrative. Number 30, this account then in Luke's Gospel. We ask that you would bless this narrative to each of us here that you would help us to grasp its significance and see the importance for us. So Lord, we look to you then to speak to each one of us in the name of the risen Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. So I've said to you that this is a journey narrative and uh, it would be more accurate to say that this is a transformative narrative of a journey. What Luke is doing here is he's teaching us how we can transform our own journeys as believers in Jesus. So Luke likes this idea of a journey and in chapter 9 he sets out how Jesus sets out uh, for Jerusalem and from chapter 9 of Luke all the way through to the end that is the background for what Luke tells us. Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem. He'll find the cross there and he'll be placed into a tomb. Now, that's the grand journey, the grand narrative in Luke's gospel. But here in chapter 24, he tells us that we too are on a journey. And our journey is very similar to the two we find in this chapter. So, so far we've seen that one of them is named. We have the name Cleopas, I think, don't we? Uh, in this account, verse 18, one whose name was Cleopas. Now there's been a lot of um, conjecture, a lot of thought about why doesn't Luke name the second individual? And it may be tonight that we'll think about that a bit more. But the main view is this. Luke wants you to put yourself into this narrative. And he wants you to be the person journeying with Cleopas. And if you do that, you'll then have a sense of how you can transform your own journey as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look then at what we find first of all. These two are taking this journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus at the end of a very tumultuous weekend. And Luke draws our attention to two things about these as they walk. The first is found in verse 15. So it was, they conversed and they reasoned as they walked together. And then the second thing we discover about them is in verse 21. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. So two things, they are reasoning and they're talking and they're hoping. And what Luke wants you to do is to recognize that on your journey, you do the same. You spend a great deal of time reasoning. Now, what does that mean? It means, first of all, you spend a great deal of time trying to make sense of the events that you've experienced. You try to find 
meaning, you try to find purpose, you try to discern what's going on in your own experiences. So these two, they were trying to make sense of the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, and these accounts of the resurrection. So as they try to make sense of what's gone on for them, they're part of the company. It's likely that they may have gone to the empty tomb themselves. So as they try to make sense and puzzle about their own experiences, we discover from the observation of Jesus in verse 17 that they are sad. So there's a connection. As a disciple of Jesus, there's a connection between trying to make sense of your life, trying to make sense of your experiences, trying to discover why, why are certain things happening. There's a connection between that and your well-being. The more you try to make sense of things, the more difficult it is and the sadder you become. So that's Luke at the start of this journey narrative. Now, if you want to, you can add another element to this and you can say these two were not only trying to make sense of their experiences, they were also trying to make sense of their faith because they have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they could not make sense of the events of the weekend and their faith in this person, Jesus. It seemed to them uh, that there was a contradiction between their faith in Jesus and what's happened. So if you want to, do it both ways. You, as a, a disciple of Jesus, as you make your own journey, you'll spend time trying to make sense of your life, of your experiences. Whether it's personal, in the family, at work, you'll be thinking about why certain things have happened. Now, don't forget, as you try to do that, that is very likely to make you sad. And if you're also trying to make sense of your faith and how your faith in Jesus fits in with all that's going on for you in the world, maybe, that will also make you sad. So it's this relationship between being a believer and thinking, the way that you think and what you think about. So that's how this journey narrative starts. Now, look at how Luke builds his picture. First of all, he tells you that without realizing it, you have the presence of the risen Jesus with you. And this is very crucial to this story. This stranger joins them on their journey. And uh, you're meant to use your imagination. So there's Cleopas and there's you, and you're, you're trying to make sense of everything, and you're walking uh, to him. Yes. Now, I guess you must be walking rather slowly, or Jesus must be walking rather quickly because he catches up with these two and he joins in with the conversation. And he's asking them about the fact that they look sad, and he's allowing them to tell him all that has happened to them, even though he knows himself, of course. But what Luke is emphasizing is that you have the presence <clears throat> of the risen Jesus, <clears throat> and you do so without knowing it. And that's true for all of us. So whatever journey you're on, whatever your destination, whatever you're puzzled by, however difficult it is for you to make sense of things, you have the presence of the risen Jesus. And then what these two tell him is this. They say, we were hoping, we were hoping that this person was going to redeem Israel. 
And there's the second thing to notice about you and I as we journey. As believers in Jesus, we have hopes, we have expectations, we believe that Jesus will do certain things, we believe that Jesus will answer our prayers, save our families, bless the church, bring people to faith. We, we journey with hope with expectations. And of course, sometimes what Luke is telling us here is this. Sometimes on our journey, our hopes start to feel threatened and our expectations start to be challenged. And we find that things are not working out as we had hoped as we had been led to believe, as we'd expected from what we've been told. So as we journey then, our minds are troubled as we try to think about things. And then we, we have this sense of our hopes and our expectations being challenged. And of course, what Luke will tell you is that there's a relationship between our sense of hope and our well-being. Once you start to lose hope, then you'll become sad. Once you start to doubt that things will be done, that what you're expecting will happen, that there will be these great things done by the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you start to doubt that, you'll feel sad and discouraged. Now, that's what Luke wants you to recognize. And I'm sure it's not difficult. I'm sure every one of us this morning can put ourselves in the position of Cleopas's companion and say, we are journeying. We are on a journey of faith like these guys. We've had very puzzling experiences. We don't know what to make of them. And we don't know how to bring our hopes and our expectations into play in the light of all the challenges that are going on around us. So we're identifying with these two. Now, as I've said to you, you are in this condition, you're feeling sad, you can't make sense of things, you've got dark and troubled thoughts, your hopes are wobbly, but the presence of the risen Jesus is with you. He's there. As, the, as uh, Paul would go on to say uh, in his letters, he's at my right hand, strengthening me and upholding me. Now, that's always the case then. We may not see him. We may not recognize it. But he is present as the risen Jesus with his disciples as we journey. Now, that's what Luke is, is building this story to convince us. So these two, they have this conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, just notice how detailed it is. They tell him the things, the things that are on their mind, the things that they've experienced, the things that they've been hoping. They tell Jesus all about the things that have been going on for them. He's encouraging them to tell him about all the things that are on their minds. Now, again, you see, what Luke will say to you is this. As a believer in Jesus, as a journeying Christian, tell him all the things that you're experiencing. All the things that are happening to you, the things that don't make sense to you, tell him the things. And that's a spiritual lesson from this account. These two don't know, of course, that he is Jesus. But Luke slips in, doesn't he, this famous phrase about their hearts burning. In a sense, they do. And Luke is trying to make a point there that needs more attention, really, how as 
believers, we operate on two levels. There's that which we see and that which we can't see. And we're always living as those who see things and those who don't see things. That's always true of us. And at the level at which we don't see, we know the presence of the risen Jesus. So they tell him all the things and he listens to them. And then verse 25, he says, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered. And then he talks to them about the scriptures. I will say more about that in a moment. And uh, as he starts to open the scriptures to them, they reach a, what's the word, junction, a fork in the road, I don't know. They reach a point on their journey where they are going one way and he is going to go another way. Now, that's the crucial moment in this narrative. And as they reach this fork in the road, the disciples recognize that this stranger to them is going to continue his journey. So Luke uses very powerful Greek terms in which they plead with him. They insist, they, they are a bit like Jacob. Uh, in Genesis, who wrestles with the stranger at night, they're very much like him. They refuse to let this stranger go, and they take him to their home. Now, that's a tremendous thing, very unexpected thing. And they take him to their home, and they have a meal. And as you can see from the account, Jesus blesses the bread, he breaks it. And in that moment, they recognize him. And the moment they recognize him, he vanishes. Now, let me say something about the journey of faith. For the most of the journey, most of the time, you and I will have the presence of the risen Jesus, but we won't see him. So for most of the journey, it'll be at that level at which we don't see. But then Luke wants you to know that there'll be moments when you'll have great clarity. There'll be moments on the journey where your eyes will be opened and you'll see the risen Jesus. There'll be moments like that. But those moments will disappear as soon as they happen. They fleet it. They glimpse it. They are the most, if you like, the most fleeting of moments, blink and you miss them, but there will be times in your journey where you will have this clarity, this moment where you know that Jesus is alive and then he's gone. Now, that happens, doesn't it, in this account? And uh, they say to each other, verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us? And then... They do an about turn, it's late in the day, they go back to Jerusalem, and the thing that Luke wants you to notice now is how different they are. They were sad at the start of the journey, and now by the journey's end, they go and they are different men, if the other one is a man. They're different disciples, aren't they? They are transformed. Now, what's changed? And of course, at one level, nothing's changed. The same events took place. Same things have happened. The same Bible was on the table, if you like. In a sense, nothing has changed. The circumstances are no different. The events are no different. The experiences are no different. What's happened is no different. So in a sense, nothing is different. But then in another sense, everything's different because they are different. And it's that difference that Luke is highlighting in this account. And I want to end like this. I want you to see here three things, and it's always three, I know, three things that Luke is identifying here that will transform your journey as a disciple of Jesus. And it'll transform your journey, even though the situation doesn't change and the experiences don't change. And what has happened still has happened, 
Nothing changes that. Luke wants you to see three things that will help you understand and transform your experience as a disciple, even though nothing is different. See, at that level, nothing is different, but you are. You are different. And I want you to see these three things. What are they? Well, in the order that Luke puts them together, uh, I think two of them will be quite simple, quite straightforward. And then the third is more of a challenge. So Luke lays them out for you. And I want to identify them like this. These are three ways to transform your journey. Your journey as a disciple of Jesus, transform it, transform yourself as you journey, if you like. First of all, it's the importance of the scriptures. Do you see it there? And uh, it's the first lesson, if you like, in transformation. Verse 25, O foolish one, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered. And then verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So we can't get away from it, guys. There it is for you. It is the place of the scriptures in transforming your journey as a disciple of Jesus. Starting with Moses, going through the prophets. You know, don't you, that later on in chapter 24, Jesus meets the 11 disciples, and for 40 days, he gives them the greatest Bible study there's ever been. He does exactly the same with them in, uh, the, uh, towards the end of the chapter. So these disciples are also transformed, the 11, by the role of the scripture. So here it is. Let's embrace it. Let's acknowledge it. It's the place of the scriptures in transforming your journey as a disciple. You look for Christ in your Bibles and you find him in your Bibles. And wherever you turn in your Bibles, you look for and you discover Jesus Christ. And that will make the difference in your journey. There's the first principle. Now, I was thinking during the week, I've been ministering now for how long? 31 years. And I was thinking, well, what should I read next? Which book should I read? Should it be New Testament, maybe? Old Testament? What should we do on a Sunday? Should we carry on with Isaiah? Should we go into Hebrews in the evening? What should we do? And then you think, well, I've read that one before, and, and I know that book quite well, and that's a book I've never read because it's too difficult. And, and you look at your Bibles like that, don't you? You look at your Bibles as a book to be read. Now, of course, what Luke is telling you is this. This isn't a book to be read. This is a person to be found. And if you take it and think of it as a person to be found, then your journey is changed. You are changed as you make that journey of faith. There's the first way then, the first transformative lesson. Look for the person. And then the second one, you see it from verses 28 down to 32, 33, is the place of relationships. And in our journey of faith, relationships are crucial. Spending time with one another, Walking with fellow disciples, talking, having fellow disciples in your home, inviting people in, spending time with them. That transforms your journey as a disciple. Now, Luke is very clever. He starts off with two of them. And as they talk together, they're not really helping each other to begin with. So, so there is a danger there, says Luke, that sometimes in your relationship, you can be focusing on the wrong things. So if in your fellowship with 
your uh, fellow believers. All you focus on is the bad experiences and the puzzling moments and the hard to understand circumstances. If that's what you're spending your time talking about on your journey with each other, then you're both going to be sad. The importance of relationship is not so that you can talk to each other about all the things you find difficult to understand. You talk to each other about the person. And that's the person, Jesus Christ. And when you see these men talking, I said men again, when you see them talking, they say, did not our hearts burn with us while he opened to us the scriptures? They're talking about him, aren't they? Not about puzzling things and difficult things and hurtful things and painful things. They're talking about him and what he has done and what he said and what he showed them. And it's that way of talking to each other that transforms these disciples. So you look for a person in the book. And then you talk about that person. You talk about him and what he's done and what he said. Talk about that with each other. And that transforms your journey. Now, I think those two things are quite straightforward. Let's come to the third. And the third one is linked to this idea of sight. So you've seen already, verse 16, their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And then towards the end, you've seen that their eyes were open, verse 31, and they knew him. Now, what Luke is doing here, and Luke is a very good doctor, we all know that, Luke is talking about your thoughts, the way that you think, how you think, what you fill your mind with. And what Luke is drawing attention to, and we'll end with this, he is drawing attention to the transformative power of thinking. And if you think right, your whole journey will be transformed. If you're thinking about the wrong things, if you're thinking about the unhelpful things or the puzzling things or the difficult things or the painful things, as well as talking about that with somebody else doesn't help, you settling your mind on all those things, that doesn't help either. You'll carry on with your journey, but you'll be sad. That's what Luke is saying. You'll be cast down. It'll be an effort, you'll drag your feet because your mind is dwelling on all the stuff that doesn't make sense. And you're trying to find an answer for it and you're spending your energies in trying to put it all together so that it becomes clear to you you're doing all of that and it's making no difference and you're going to be sad so it's all about your mind it's about what is happening to you and these two are transformed because they're now thinking as they should and Jesus says to them, you should have been thinking like this all along. And that's what he means when he says in verses 25 and 26, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, ought not the Christ. You see, all along, everything could have made sense to them if they'd only thought about things in the right way. But they didn't. And like us, sometimes... We don't think about things the right way. We are looking at things the wrong way round. We are trying to make sense of things from the wrong point of view. And so often we can spend so much effort and so much time inside our own heads and get it all wrong. Whereas if we'd been thinking clearly from the beginning, then our experience would be different. So I want you to go away with these three ideas and seek to use them in your journey. As a believer in Jesus, first of all, look for the person in the book. That's the first lesson. Secondly, talk about this person to each other. 
when you're together, when you have the chance, talk about him together, share what he has done together. And then the third thing, to, to let it burn into you this morning, these principles. The third thing is be careful how you think, what you fill your mind with, what you do with your thoughts. Be very careful what you are filling your mind with. If you fill it with all the confusion and the heartache, and if you try to get it together yourself to make sense of things, your journey is going to be tough and you're going to walk slowly dragging your feet you'll be weighed down by what's going on in your own heads be very careful about what you think about how you think about it focus on the person and talk about it and that's how to transform your journey Let's pray together.